Good day. And today we're going to be going through uh, diving into the first of our seven values as our local community. And our first value is enjoy and encounter the living God. I mean, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to enjoy and encounter the living God? On the 25th of November, 1647, a new catechism, uh, that's a question and answer document, was presented to the English Parliament following the Civil War, in which Parliament had imprisoned King Charles. And Parliament wanted to reform the Church of England to make it more Calvinist. And the new catechism to gain Parliament's approval began with these words. What is the chief end of man? And the question, the answer was, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So in the midst of all the chaos of civil war, the English Parliament approves a statement about the chief purpose of humans, of humanity, to enjoy and glorify God. Friends, you're made to enjoy God. Are you enjoying him? Augustine of Hippo, writing around the year 400, said, uh, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Augustine knew the truth of those words. He had been a spiritual seeker in his life. He'd spent nearly 11 years in a sect called Manichaeanism, which combined elements of Zoroastrianism, Buddhism and Christianity, all mixed up together. Uh, finally, however, he became a Christian. And John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, wrote, And there is but one God in heaven above and in the earth beneath, so there is one happiness for created spirits, either in heaven or on earth. The one God made our heart for himself, and it cannot find its rest until it rests in him. We still pant after something else, something which we have not, and that something is neither more nor less than the knowledge and the love of God, without which no spirit can be happy, either in heaven or earth. This happy knowledge of the true God is only another name for religion. It's a wonderful quote, isn't it, by John Wesley. If the enjoyment of God is the purpose for which humans are made and the meaning of religion, then why do we feel that, that is not the case. Why is it often not the case of enjoying God? Uh, one, I think, uh, there's three possible things. I'm sure there's more. But number one, we can substitute enjoying God, uh, the uncreated God, for enjoying created things. OK, so Paul talks about this in Romans 1. And it could be the love of family, the love of wealth, the love of children, the love of ourselves, the love of employment or enjoyment. But we can be tempted to rank all those things higher than our love of God. Number two, we can substitute knowledge about God for enjoying God. And we can confuse knowing facts about God um, and theology rather than enjoying God. Okay. Number three, we can be tempted to think holiness and enjoying God are, are opposite. When in the words of John Piper, holiness is the condition of the heart in which God is our greatest happiness. C.S. Lewis said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we're made for another world. And it would seem that the Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea. One of the biggest stumbling blocks in enjoying God is having a wrong view of God. It is important that we know about God, certain facts, in order that we love him as he is, not that we imagine him to be. C.S. Lewis made a brilliant observation in The Abolition of Man. 
uh, that if you had four things to classify, religion, science, magic and technology, how would you classify them? We might be tempted to put religion and magic together and science and technology together. But Lewis says that there's a better, more deeper way of linking these things. Religion and science go together because they aim at conforming the mind to objective truth that is out there. Objective reality. Whilst magic and science and technology, magic and technology, on the other hand, are trying to form object conform, sorry, objective reality to the human will. So instead of us changing to become like what is real, it's rather that we rather bring the real and change it in order to fit to ourselves and to what we want to happen. So Lewis writes. There's something which unites magic and applied science, which we now call technology, uh, while separating both from the wisdom of earlier ages. For the wise men of old, the cardinal problem was how to conform the soul to reality, and the solution is knowledge, self-discipline and virtue. For magic and applied science alike, the problem is how to subdue reality to the wishes of men, and the solution is a technique. To enjoy God, therefore, we must redirect our souls to the true reality that is God. And this is obtained through knowledge of God, uh, whether that's knowledge about the Lord Jesus Christ, in order that we can put our faith in him, self-discipline as we put to death the things of the flesh, and virtue as we start walking in a new way of life. And in Matthew 5, 8, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. If you want to see God, what do you have to do? You need a pure heart. You need an internal change from the Holy Spirit. So if we're to conform ourselves to God, it stands to reason then that we should not try and conform God to ourselves. To try and make a mental image of the God that, or how we got, wish God was like. You know, that he affirms the things that we affirm and he condemns the things that we condemn. But rather, we should destroy those images of God but rather, because they're only idols of our own heart and mind, but rather turn to the worship of the true God and conform ourselves to him, the God revealed in Jesus Christ, as witnessed in the scriptures. To make God in our image is more akin to magic than religion. Rather, we need to conform ourselves to his image. The enjoyment of God begins with the death of self. It is no longer fulfilling my desires, but rather being captivated with a desire for God. As Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, 25, if anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will find it. The way to gain life is to lose it. Death is the way to life. To enjoy God, friends, God must be the chief aim of your life. So having decided that we want to enjoy God, now we come to encountering God. In Ephesians 3, 16 to 21, Paul prays, saying, I pray according to the wealth of his glory that he will grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person, that Christ will dwell in your hearts through faith, so that because you've been rooted and grounded in love, you'll be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you will be filled up with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power that is working within us is able to do far beyond all that we can ask, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul in this prayer speaks of four realities. Number one, that we are strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner person, verse 16, that Christ will dwell in your heart, verse 17, that you know the love of God that surpasses knowledge, verse 12. So it surpasses that head knowledge. Uh, number four, be filled up with all the fullness of God, uh, verse 20. 
So being strengthened with power, knowing the love of God, it's both very, they're both experiences and they're encounters with the divine. Is your heart aflame? Do you feel it burning with a passion for God? When thinking about any encounter with God, we should think about three options that this could be God, it could be myself or it could be something else. OK, in Second Corinthians eleven fourteen, we're told even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And we're warned in First John 4, 1, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to determine if they're from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. As such, we need discernment we need to be within the christian community a church to discuss and chat about our own experiences and we need to know our bibles in order that we may know what is true and what is false in first thessalonians 5 21 paul writes examine all things hold fast to what is good so each of us are here because we've been awakened to the reality that there is a god a god who's been revealed in history as jesus of nazareth and from that moment on, the struggle begins, does it not? The war between the spirit and the flesh begins as our desires and our delights change. We are slowly put sin to death in our lives, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And as this purgation continues, we have moments of illumination or insight, moments of delight and wonder as we're overcome, perhaps emotionally, with truths about God. We read scripture, it becomes alive inside us. We pray, we feel an encounter with God. We might have that burning in our chest. However, each of us gets to the place where we might be faced with doubt. Our, our emotions fail us. We just run out of emotional energy. We enter the dark shadow of death. Perhaps intellectual questions cripple your mind and your heart and nothing else. You can do nothing else but leap into the void, trusting God to catch you. And that is when God does catch us and we feel his warm embrace. We know that we're home. And this is often expressed as an experience of the love of God. In John Bunyan's autobiography, he speaks at length about these doubts and intrusive thoughts that fill his mind. And yet he learned in those times of testing to become a child in the father's arms. In Isaiah 66, 13, God says, I will comfort you there in Jerusalem as a mother comforts her child. In Isaiah 40, 11, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms holding them close to his heart he will gently lead the mother sheep with their young friends are you willing to see yourself as a child who needs the mother's comfort or as a lamb that needs to be held by the shepherd perhaps that is what is needed we need to trust god that he's going to take care of us when our minds are filled with these doubts trials and tribulations we leap Jesus tells us in Mark 10 to 15, I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. So friends, cast yourself as a child into the father's arms today. I've mentioned here that the valley of the shadow of death within the experiencing of God. Because we must come to see God both in good times, but also in the bad times. In Romans 8, 28, we read, and we know all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. He's the God who brings light out of darkness, life out of death, good out of evil. And one of the best and most tried ways of experiencing God is to become aware of God. And I've said this before, but traditionally, when we say God has created the world, we do not mean like a shoemaker who makes a shoe. You can kill the shoemaker and yet the shoe will survive. Yeah, you know, God just started it off at the beginning and now we no longer need him. No, rather God creates as a musician. If he stopped playing, the universe would cease to exist. God is not like a being like 
a tree or a cloth or even an angel, even an object in the universe or even the universe itself. He's not just one more thing in a list of objects that exists. He's not like a man, only bigger and better in the sky. He's to quote one philosopher, the infinite wellspring of all that is, in whom all things live and move and have their being. God is not on the list at all. He's beyond being or being itself. He's the never ending source of all that exists, the foundation upon which all objects and beings, men, angels, higher beings, even the whole universe, the whole created order is utterly and always utterly dependent. The unity underlying all things. If the music stopped playing, all of the lights are going to go out. Paul says all of this to the Greeks in Athens in Acts 17, 27, 28. He says his purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and exist. For Paul, God is never far from each of us because in him we live, we move, we exist. He's causing you and I to exist right at this very moment. He's sustaining us and all of the created order out of nothing. And that's why science can't even begin to talk about God. He's beyond science because he's beyond created things you can measure and, and those sort of things. God is uncreated and all that exists, all that can be measured, quantified, is created. It's matter, it's made of things. He is uncreated, creator of all that exists. So think about this often when you're driving your car when you're cleaning your dishes, when you take a shower, when you're sitting at your desk at work. Right at this moment, God is causing every atom in the whole universe to exist. Right now, he's causing you to live, to move, to exist. Imagine creation as music that is playing and all the atoms in your body are vibrating with the song of creation. God is here. God is everywhere. Learn to think about that often. Practice thinking about it. In the words of William Penn, there is no crown but by the cross and no eternal life but through death. And it is only just those evil and barbarous affections that crucified Christ to flesh should now by his holy cross be crucified in you. There are many ways to cultivate an experience of God. There's worship services, sitting in silence, there's imagining a passage of scripture, meditating upon a verse or a passage of scripture. And in Mark 20, 29 to 31, one of the scribes of the Jewish Torah comes to Jesus and asks him, which of the commands is the greatest? And we're told, verse 29, Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And the first commandment and the second is like it. It is you shall love your neighbour as yourself. And there are no other commandments greater than these. For Jesus, the greatest commandment is love God and love your neighbour. And God has been defined as the God of Israel, as Jesus recites the Shema. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Paul takes the language of God and Lord from the Shema and he writes, For us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we live, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. And it sums up all of the created order with the God of Israel as revealed in the Shema. All things are from the Father through the Son, who is the visible image of the invisible God. All of creation, all things come from the Father through the Son. And friends, I hope you have seen the enjoying and encountering God, and not just about these peak mountaintop experiences that you might have had at conference or in other places, but rather they're also about the dark valleys the dry deserts and also the just everyday day-to-day -day of life if we want to be awakened to see every moment become alive with the grandeur of god and god is with you when you're cleaning your dishes 
as much as he is here among us now. John of the Cross, a writer on the spiritual life, says, Never give up on prayer. Should you find dryness or difficulty, persevere in it for this very reason. God offers desires to see what love your soul has. And love is not tried by ease or satisfaction. It's like when we're filled with the love of God, when we desire God, he wants us love more so that we can get a greater portion of him. So that we're never satisfied, really, because we're always wanting more of God. It's a never-ending wellspring of all that exists. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, wrote, The tendency of fire is to go out. So watch the fire on the altar of your heart. Anyone who's tended a fireplace fire knows it needs to be stirred up occasionally. Friends, what do you love? Do you love the everlasting God or, or do you love created things that are going to fade, a vapour upon the wind? We are dust. And to dust we will return. Are we chasing after things that will endure or things that will fade? In conclusion, then, each of us have been invited into this purpose of humanity to enjoy God. And in John 14, 21, Jesus says, the person who has my commands and obeys them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will reveal myself to him. Friends, we want that revelation of Christ and it comes to those who love and obey him. So over this week, reflect upon your own desires, your own loves. Do you love God with your heart, with your soul, with your mind? Do you wish to enjoy and encounter God? And at what cost? At what cost? What are you willing to give up in order to come? and to meet with him. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have in order to know and love you and to enjoy you. And Lord, we pray that you would guide each one of us as we think and dwell upon these thoughts this week. Amen.